Hi, I'm John Cohen with Science Magazine. I'm a staff writer, a senior correspondent. We're going to have a discussion for the next hour with four scientists who have been involved with the discussion and the debate about the origin of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they don't always agree with each other, which is part of the reason that we've assembled them and AAAS and Science are sponsoring this. Because what we want to do is we want to show that you can have a civilized discussion with people who don't necessarily agree with each other and come at something from different scientific perspectives. And uh, I'd like to introduce each of them to you. Um, Alina Chan is a postdoctoral fellow at the Broad Institute, and she studies vector and genetic engineering and synthetic biology. And she has a new book coming out viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, that she has co-authored. And we have Michael Warby from the University of Arizona, and he's uh, the head of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And Michael has been involved with studying the origin of HIV and influenza. Um, Jesse Bloom is a professor at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, and he is also a Howard Hughes uh, medical investigator. He's a, um, I would call you an evolutionary biologist as well. I hope that's uh, appropriate. Uh, and uh, we have from Singapore, Lim Fa Wong, who is a professor at the Duke NUS Medical School and has been involved with origin research for several viruses, including SARS and Nipah and Hendra and SARS-CoV-2. And Lim Fa also has worked with the Wuhan Institute of Virology for many years and Shi Zhang Li. So thank you all for agreeing to do this. And I'd, I'd like to start um, very simply by having each of you explain what you think the most likely scenario is briefly. And why don't we start with the order of the people on the screen from my, what I'm looking at. Jesse, could you uh, briefly tell us, and you are muted at the moment, could you uh, briefly just tell us what you think the most likely scenario is for the origin? Yeah, so SARS-CoV-2 uh, is, is clearly derived from a bat uh, SARS-related coronavirus. Uh, and we know that there are, uh, we now know that there are viruses quite similar to SARS-CoV-2, not, not close enough to be like the direct ancestor, but close enough to be the, you know, a relative from a few decades ago or five or six decades ago uh, that are circulating out there in nature. Uh, and the question is really how uh, the bat coronavirus that, that became SARS-CoV-2 uh, got to Wuhan and started spreading uh, from person to person. And in my view, there's, uh, you know, two plausible ways that it could have happened. It could have been uh, some unknown uh, zoonotic uh, infection of a person or another animal that infected a person. Uh, you know, that's what happened with the original uh, SARS coronavirus one. And then the other possibility is that we know that uh, labs uh, in Wuhan, in particular, uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology had large scale programs to collect uh, and study SARS related coronaviruses that were thought uh, to pose a high risk of being able to infect humans. And so because they were collecting uh, large numbers of these viruses and bringing them back to the lab to study, it's possible that there was an accident uh, in the process of this that, that led to the emergence of the virus in humans. Linfa? Yeah, so obviously, you know, I have to declare, right, you know, I work very closely with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, so that may be kind of a uh, uh, both extreme. On one hand, you can consider it's conflicted. On the other hand, I think uh, I'm the best person in the world to comment most what's the most likely origin of the virus, right? So, you know, I've worked on Hendra virus, I've worked on Nipah virus, SARS, MERS, and now COVID-19. So, uh, to me, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jesse says very clearly that we're dealing with three viruses. The outbreak virus, that's what we call the Wuhan human one. And now we have alpha, beta, delta, and a gamma, and so on. So these are the viruses that are ready to jump to human cause disease. I call it outbreak virus. Obviously, to me, that this is not the virus that uh, you know was circulating. And uh, before that is what I call a progenitor virus. And then even before that, then we had the ancestral virus. And the progenitor virus, people ask me, how do you define that? I say it has to be at least 99.9% .9 identical. And then the ancestral virus is different. Ancestral virus is that it bears certain you know, uh, resemblance and uh, we have found that many, many in the bats. So the question is that uh, I think, where is the progenitor virus? I think Jesse basically you know, asked the same question. 
But because my kind of very, very close working relation with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the other thing is, I think maybe I'm the only scientist that have been working on coronavirus before COVID-19. So I can say that, you know, to you mean have this, this group, Limpha. Yeah, 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 yeah that's, sorry, sorry. Of course, I'm talking about this group, right? You know, so, so this is where, you know, I get a, a kind of, you know, a question later, I'm going to answer the panelist is that, are we discussing about, you know, an engineered virus or are we discuss about, you know, a live virus that uh, uh, somebody isolate and leaked? Or we're discussing about, you know, the very, very remote uh, uh, but possible cases of, uh, you know, people are sampling in the cave and brought the virus back, you know, to the lab. So what I can say is that with my inside knowledge and in the Wuhan Institute of Virology plus how we think as a bat coronavirus scientists, you know, before COVID-19, who would work on an engineer virus, which is not related for SARS-CoV-1. So that to me is, you know, in my mind and in our field is very, very strong is that if somebody was engineer virus as today SARS-CoV-2, 10 years ago, two years ago, three years ago, and I said, I really respect that person because that guy, it has a crystal ball can see through which virus is dangerous and they won't play with it. So that's where I sit. Okay, Great, so- thank you. Yeah. Alina? Yeah, so this question gets asked uh, to me a lot, like which hypothesis is more likely? And I, yeah. I need to lay out the caveats here. The caveats are that we have very little information and mm -hmm. a lot of information is being withheld. So it's not that we can't find that information, but people know and they're not sharing it with us. And so, where we are today is that there's no dispositive evidence for either natural or lab scenario. So all of the observations to date are still consistent with both mm -hmm. scenarios. And the focus really should be finding more information to help guide a more confident estimate of which scenario is more likely. Uh, but I have to say that personally, for me, I think a lab scenario is more likely today based on the evidence that we know. So a lab infection, uh, a lab related incident can span a wide range of activities all the way from field work, so collecting samples from people, sick people and sick animals, thousands of them, bringing them back to the lab, growing them up, studying them in cells and animal models, like genetically modifying them, engineering them. And, and so it's not necessary that people would have been working with just SARS-1-like viruses because there were so many viruses in nature. The mandate was to predict the next pandemic. It's not necessary that the next pandemic will be caused by SARS-1 again. So there were many scientists very interested in studying very diverse SARS viruses. And a lot of this work was done at low biosafety level, BSL-2. So not airborne, uh, not pro cannot protect you from being infected by an airborne virus at BSL-2. And we know from recent documents that there were many diverse SARS viruses being worked with in the lab and as part of an international collaboration. So people outside of China also knew about this work. And part of that involved modifying the viruses in a way that could reasonably increase their transmissibility and ability to cause severe disease in humans. So today, I'd say that I'm leaning towards a lab leak, but we really still need to focus on getting evidence, getting more data. Thanks. Mike? Yeah. Um, I, Linfa, I, I've also worked on uh, MERS and, and uh, other coronaviruses uh, in the past, looking at their molecular evolution. Um, so as, as some of the viewers will know, uh, Alina, Jesse, and I uh, co-signed a, a letter to science uh, a, a few months back, sort of suggesting that we need to consider both the lab leak idea and the uh, um, natural zoonosis, as we call it, jumping from animals to humans. Uh, and, and so I, for, for me, I've, I've come at it with a, a, an open mind, uh, but the evidence, you know, the, the more we know about uh, what happened uh, with with people working at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, the actual viruses that they had uh, in their lab. Uh, and the more we find out about the natural cousins of this virus in bats, um, the, the more convinced I am that this was a, a SARS-1-like natural transmission. Uh, and, and for me, the, the real preeminent feature of this virus uh, is that it started spreading 
from a very early point and, and perhaps the earliest point at Huanan Market, which is a, a seafood market uh, that also sold live mammals. Uh, and so the very species that were involved in SARS-1 uh, were being sold at this market. Uh, and lo and behold, if you look at the early cases of this uh, virus, the preponderance of them are linked to one single market, a tiny, tiny little fraction of a city of 11 million people. Uh, and uh, there's been confusion about whether that pattern of early cases being linked to that market could be what we call ascertainment bias, where those the, the samples from that market or uh, patients from that market were cherry picked because there was focus on it. Uh, and recently I've been working on this uh, and can tell you that they, they were not cherry picked. There really was a preponderance of early cases uh, at, at, at the place that was selling the very animals that brought us SARS-1. So I want to build on what um, Mike is saying. I want to back up for a moment for people who might not know the history as well as all of you do. This pandemic began as an outbreak in Wuhan that was noticed and publicized because of 27 cases at the Huanan seafood market in Wuhan mm -hmm. in late December. Um, but let, let's, let's build on that. And there's a question that came in from a USA Today reporter, Elizabeth Weiss, that, that essentially is what Mike was getting at, which is how did this virus show up in Wuhan? What happened? And uh, Mike just spelled out a very specific place that it emerged that he thinks is what happened there there's more detail there of course about how it got to that market but i'm curious what each of you think is the most like occam's razor and this was elizabeth weiss's question scenario for the virus showing up in wuhan um jesse what do you think i mean again i think we can't really say how the virus got to wuhan i mean i, I mean there's just not enough uh evidence to, to trace how it got there. But I mean, we do know that uh, the bats that carry the viruses that are closely related to SARS-CoV-2 and could be the natural predecessor, you know, they don't live in Wuhan. They live in uh, in other areas of uh, China and Southeast Asia. So so clearly, there, you know, there's not a high, uh, probably any natural prevalence of uh, viruses closely related to SARS-CoV-2 uh, in Wuhan. So, I mean, it's possible that it was uh, by some unknown process. We still don't really understand the process by which uh, SARS-CoV-1 uh, got to where that outbreak was identified. But I mean, again, I go back to, and this is why I still think, uh, you know, continue to think a lot because highly plausible. There was a large scale effort to collect. I mean, if you read this, this NIH uh, R01 that describes a collaborative work between EcoHealth Alliance and Wuhan Institute of Virology, there were large scale efforts to collect a thousand per year of samples specifically from bats that were thought to harbor high risk SARS related coronaviruses. So I think that's an obvious conduit uh, from these bats to Wuhan. And we can't say that that was a conduit. It could have been some mm -hmm. unknown process as happened, uh, you know, with SARS-CoV-1 and Guangdong. But I think that you know, that, that's that's certainly the best documented conduit from these back caves to Wuhan, right? So I want to just briefly explain, you're referring to the DARPA proposal, right? When... This is driving the DARPA one, but also the the uh, the NIH R01 that the Intercept okay. published. Well, I don't think people know what R01s are or any of this stuff. So let me just briefly <laughs> explain that there are grant proposals that are to the National Institutes of Health in the United States and to the Department of Defense that were put together by the EcoHealth Alliance run by Peter Dejak in New York, who's been a longtime collaborator with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And Lympha is part of one of those proposals that was not funded by the Department of Defense, by DARPA. And in that proposal, there are details that you're pulling out and describing, Jesse. So that, that's the basic idea. Lympha, what do you think is the way, how do you think the virus showed up in Wuhan? What do you think happened? Yeah, what so... We don't you know. know. Let's, be, let's be honest. None of us know what of happened. Right? As, as Jesse says, you know, I I was personally in Wuhan January 14th to 18th. So I was on the ground. In 2020. Heard, 2020. Yeah, 2020, not 21, of course. Uh, I could not travel, you know. After, after February 2020, I'm not allowed to leave Singapore. So I have not been traveling at all. 
So January 14th to 18th, you know, I had a pre-arranged because the uh, annual scientific retreat in Shenzhen Li's uh, Institute, the lab, uh, everybody doing, doing the back research. I'm a, a scientific advisor and all the professors. So I go there a few times a year. So that, you know, was going to happen in December 2019, but uh, I hosted a NIPA at 20, you know, so I always say in retrospective, Nipper at 20, we brought all the scientists, you know, worked on backbone virus, you know, especially folks on hand the Nipper virus to Singapore. So we had a 300 scientists, basically December 9th to 12th in Singapore. So I had to defer that and that's only agreed for me to go there January 14th to the 18th. So on the ground, you know, of course, I do a lot of discussions and, the, you know, you always discuss the scenario is like SARS-1, right? Basically, you know, of civics in the market and start to see the market people have a high preference and eventually go to the Guangzhou hospital and then really transmit to the world. So in my mind, deep in my mind, that's very clear because the first 27 cases, as John says, you know, is associated with the market. So my initial kind of a hypothesis in my mind is very clear. An animal brought virus to the Wuhan market and could be the progenitor virus because there is a clear evidence of a heavily animal to animal transmission. Because by the time China CDC went there on December 30th, they sampled the environmental and they sampled the animals. And you found that the WHO report basically said that all the animals are negative, but the environmental samples are heavily, heavily con contaminated with SARS-CoV-2. And they got two samples had a live virus isolation. Now, I have been in this game for 30 years and I have gone to, you know, uh, collaborate with many different places. If you get a PCR positive and a serology positive, you know, in animals and environment samples, you're doing well. To get a live virus isolation from a market, that really tells me the virus has to replicate in one of the live animals in the market. So this is the part I'm disappointed because the Chinese could not zoom in to which animal was involved in that process. So to me, the Wuhan uh, uh, Huanan seafood market definitely play a role in amplifying the virus. Whether that also play a role in adapting the virus like the civics did in the Guangdong market, I could not tell because, you know, the virus is already very, very close to the human virus. What I've become less certain is how the virus got to the market because, you know, initially I saw clearly it's animal, but when the report comes out to say, you know, the first index case could be, you know, actually had a no contact with the market, you know, so, so I, you know, start to think there is a possibility of a progenitor virus actually carried by the human to the market and the, through animal transmission, the progenitor become the outbreak virus. Of course, as Jesse said, you know, we don't have data to support any of this, but it's clearly that, you know, there's two scenarios. The complication now is look back of the scenario is the asymptomatic infection. When I was in Wuhan on January 14th, I thought, no problem. We have done SARS and, you know, we have all the tools right now. We can do better. But later I realized that by the time we discovered that virus is transmitting has a severe cases, it's almost too late because the 80% can be asymptomatic or mild. So now you go back to the index case. The index case, you know, clearly says, you know, I don't have any contact with the Wuhan Wuhan see for the market. But the index case is the first one had a, a symptom. What happens, that person got the virus from somebody had a contact with the Huanan seafood market, happened to be asymptomatic. So this whole thing become really, really complicated. But what I can conclude from my own on the ground, you know, uh, 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 discussion and the data I have seen is that one thing is clear, the market played a role, whether it's amplification or adaptation to the early events in Wuhan. Yeah. Okay, and Alina, what about you? Yeah, so this question is really astounding, right? That mm. close to two years after the pandemic emerged, we have no idea when or how it started in Wuhan City. Mm. Uh, and it's not because we don't have the technology today in 2021 or 2019 at the time to trace it. We do have very advanced technology to trace the uh, source of outbreaks, but because a lot of information was withheld and access withheld. So I'm going to pull a John Stewart and say that you in 2019, a novel SARS coronavirus with a novel genetic modification appeared in a city where there's a lab studying novel SARS coronaviruses with novel genetic modifications. So we cannot rule out the lab origin right now. It's very fully on the table. Uh, we know that the natural origin is very plausible still. 
So there are markets in Wuhan where there were wild animals that could have been hosts of the virus being sold, but the information has not been made available to us. So we don't have access to even the animals sold at that market. We don't have access to existing data. We know that there were scientists who were cataloging all the animals on a per month basis at that market. Somehow that information was not shared with, with us. So we are we're fully blocked from investigating how did this virus even emerge in that city. So we, we don't have information on the contact tracing of the earliest cases. So we have no insight to November cases or October cases of COVID-19. We have no access to the banked human samples in Wuhan, which would have told us when the virus was first circulating in the city. So there's so many things that we have no access to, and we should be pushing for access to those data and information so that we can track the origin. Well, the, the Chinese government has made it clear that it does not welcome the idea of a probe of the Wuhan <laughs> Institute of Virology. So absent a probe, how do we clarify that? What, what can you do without the cooperation of the Chinese government to clarify the Wuhan Institute of Virology hypothesis? So am I taking that question? Yeah, or anyone else. I mean, go for it, Alina. How do you clarify it? I mean, you, do you think the Chinese government is going to somehow change its mind because of pressure from other countries and say, OK, let forensic scientists come in and do a probe. We'll open up our freezers and all our life. Do you think that's likely to happen? I don't think that's likely to happen until a better case has been built outside of China, which I think is fully possible. So China is not like a sealed up black box <laughs> that nobody can see inside and get into. Uh, especially in the early days of the pandemic, a lot of information was flowing out of China. And in the months leading up to the pandemic as well, and maybe even years leading up to the pandemic, a lot of information about the research being done in Wuhan was flowing out of China. So we should be tapping into those sources of information right now instead of giving up and begging to go into China. Um, we have to fill out the picture ourselves, collect all the pieces of information that multiple people have in many different countries and put it all together to fill out a big picture before going back to China and say, look, We've collected all this information. Now we have a clearer idea of whether it was natural or from a lab. And now we would like you to cooperate and give us access to data. John, could I um, answer this question about how I think the virus most likely got there? And what I feel like is that there's, there's sometimes a tendency um, when we, we don't have uh dispositive evidence one way or the other to to then go beyond that and suggest that hypotheses hypotheses are equally likely uh, and uh, you know I, I really don't think these hypotheses are equally likely just as uh, i'm sure uh, alina and and jesse would not uh think that uh, this virus having been developed as a bioweapon is an equally likely hypothesis or that it came from snakes or that it was modified from a uh, distantly related virus like RATG13. Um, and um, in, in, in terms of uh, the analogy with SARS-1, I think it's important for people to understand what happened with SARS-1. So with SARS-1, animals like civets, raccoon dogs, badgers, all carried progenitor viruses uh, and wet, so-called wet markets where you can go and buy a live animal, have it slaughtered and take it home, um, were a conduit for that progenitor virus getting into uh, humans. Uh, and those same animals uh, were sold uh, uh, immediately prior to the pandemic at one on market and, and three other places in, in, in Wuhan. Um, and I, I just also wanted to mention that the, these horseshoe bats that carry these viruses, there's been a lot of work on them in Southern China, as Jesse mentioned, but they do also circulate uh, or live in huge numbers in, uh, in Hubei province, uh, in Ensha prefecture, there, some of the massive, the most massive cave uh, complexes in the world uh, are there, and they they are filled with uh, the, these specific species of horseshoe bats that carry these viruses. So it's not implausible that it would get from a bat to a farm, uh, making uh, creating raccoon dogs, and then mm -hmm. on to humans through through a market. So you mentioned RATG13 uh, for people who don't know what that is, and I imagine that's a lot of people. 
the closest bat virus found to SARS-CoV-2 until a couple of weeks ago was a virus isolated by the Wuhan Institute of Virology researchers in Mojiang Mine in Yunnan province. But then a paper came out a couple of weeks ago from a research group in Laos, working with the Pasteur Institute there and in France, that found three new isolates that are closer. And they're closer uh, in the entire genome, as Mike uh, has shown, but they're also closer, most importantly, in the way that the virus actually binds to human cells. It, the spike protein on the top of uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a little area that's called the receptor binding domain. I'm sorry to get nerdy, but it <laughs> binds onto the human cell and it almost perfectly matches in these new bat viruses, the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. Jesse, does that alter your thinking at all? And, and I've spoken with several researchers who say, including Limfa, who said to me, this furthers the case of natural origin because you don't have to imagine that a laboratory created this. It's there in nature. Look at these bat viruses. Does it have any, and, and this is a question that also came up from a reporter who had asked, Drew Winshaw from the Wall Street Journal, does this have any influence on how you think, how you tilt things natural versus lab origin? Uh, honestly, not really. So I think that, I think as Lin Fong nicely put out, there are sort of three questions. What are sort of the deep ancestors of SARS-CoV-2, uh, which we do to studies like the one you're describing, we now have a increasingly good idea of there are viruses that could be the deep ancestors of SARS-CoV-2 that have been identified in Yunnan, like this RATG13 virus, have been identified in Laos, like <clears throat> the virus called Banal 2052 that you're just referring to. And then we know what SARS-CoV-2 is. And the question is, how did we get from that uh, deeper ancestor to SARS-CoV-2? I mean, although there have obviously been various sort of <clears throat> crazy and conspiratorial ideas that have been floated about <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 being engineered from scratch and things like that, I think that's clearly never been uh, a reasonable hypothesis. I think the the, the plausible ways that this virus could uh, come from a lab uh, have to do with the lab collecting uh, SARS-related coronaviruses that they think are going to have the potential to jump to humans, like be able to bind to human ACE2 and, and things like that. And then, you know, either have an accident with one of these viruses they've collected or in the process of slightly modifying that virus. Those, those are the plausible versions of the of the lab accident theory. Uh, and, you know, so obviously those are contingent on those natural viruses existing out there in the first place. So I don't, I think the question is not, are there bat SARS-like viruses related to SARS-CoV-2? The answer is, is clearly yes, and I think it's great that we're getting a better understanding of what those viruses are. But the question is, how did those bat SARS-related coronaviruses that are the direct ancestors of SARS-CoV-2 get to Wuhan and start spreading in humans? And and that question, I don't think we're further along. So, uh, so Jesse, even, even if researchers found a bat coronavirus that was 99.9% .9 the same as SARS-CoV-2, you would still ask, well, no. I, think, I think if you got to 99.9 .9 or 99 point, you know, I mean, honestly, we'd probably expect the yeah. you know, from a year before to be like more like 99.98 percent identical or something. <laughs> then, then, then I think you're starting to talk about something extremely proximal. And then, you know, wherever that virus was, you think that's probably how bad humans. But a virus like this, uh, this one that you were just describing, the, which is called Banal 2052, which is a little bit more uh, similar, RATG13 is about... 96%, and this one's like a little bit more than that, still less than 97%. I mean, those are closely related, but it's, you know, it's not like your dad, it's like your great, 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 great grandfather. Uh, and uh, and so I don't think it really, again, tells us exactly how these viruses uh, got to uh, Wuhan. And, and I think there's a large number of hypotheses. I think everything that Lin Fa and Mike and Alina suggested mm -hmm. is ways that the virus could have got to Wuhan, I think are all possible, but I don't think discovering more bat SARS related ancestors really tells us which of those happened. Lim, I'm sorry, you're raising your hand. <laughs> yeah, I, have, I have two questions, basically, you know, uh, to the audience or to the, to the panel, you know, not specific to anybody. The first is, what do you think of SARS-1? Have we resolved the natural origin of SARS-1 or is it a man-made as well? Okay, so I want you to comment on that. Secondly, is that, uh, you know, especially for Alina and Jesse, is that, uh, 
you know, if we believe there's a lab involvement at what kind of level, you know, from the very beginning to now, I personally have been following this kind of evolution of the hypothesis. The first one is a biological weapon, you know, program got wrong and leaked. The second is to say it's not a biological weapon. It's just a play with the virus man-made and it's leaked. And the third is to say, no, 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 they did not do anything, but they have been growing the virus and it's leaked. And now there's a, for, a, a fourth and a fifth terminology to say it's lab associated. That means that nothing to do with the lab, but lab staff was involved. The latest you know, in Lancet is research associated. Okay, now, so I want you guys to tell me what research associated means. So to me, if research associated means is that a research was sampling or do a, a, even a you know, ecological study, go to the back cave, they should have equal chance to be infected and bring the virus to Wuhan, okay? So how do we differentiate natural origin and a research associated? And I can tell you, as I think, you know, Mike was saying at the beginning, a city of 11 million, like Wuhan, can you imagine how much trafficking of wildlife to go to that market and other markets every day. And you think how many scientists are sampling bats every year and every day. The risk of a natural kind of animal handler bring the virus. I think if we, we're talking about the last scenario, research associate means that the scientists did not sample bats, did not, it's not a virology, but happened to be infected and bring the virus to Wuhan. Then if I said, you know, if that's the scenario we consider as a lab or research associate, then I said the boundary between, between a research associate and natural origin is almost the same. Because what's the difference between research, go to the uh, back, you know, a, a cave to observe the, you know, the ecology and the behavior versus somebody to go there to collect a guano or to sample the bats for meat, right? I can tell you the second possibility or the second scenario, the frequency is going to be two logs, if not three logs higher than the first. So, so, so log differences are something yeah. I, I don't think most people understand. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hundred times to thousand times difference. Yeah. And yeah. So, so, so what do you guys think of this idea? I mean, the argument Lympha is making essentially is that it's far more likely that somebody had been exposed to a bat virus or a bat virus that went through another species and came to the Wuhan marketplace than it is for a researcher who went to trap bats and release them and sample them would then come back to Wuhan with the virus. There, there are far more, a hundred, a thousand times more people who and are- And the PPE, and the PPE, because and the, the people, people goes the to people the cave have a full protection. Right, yeah. the people who are the researchers are supposed to be wearing protective yeah. equipment so that they don't yeah. get infected. It yeah. doesn't mean they always were, but that's yeah. the idea. So what do you think of that argument that it's it's just far more probable that it was somebody who wasn't a lab researcher? I, I, I would agree with uh, that. It, it is uh, conceivable uh, that the virus made it to, to Wuhan in someone who is specifically doing this kind of work. And it is an issue that as, as the scientific community we need to think very carefully about the risks associated with coming into contact with the very species in the very pl places, th these bats that harbored this particular lineage, which we now know has, has emerged both in SARS-1 and SARS-2. So these are dangerous viruses. Uh, but, you know, there, there have been studies showing that in the villages around some of these caves that have these bats, 3% of, of, of just the, the people there have antibodies to these viruses. Uh, and so there are just so many more uh, opportunities for non-market or non-research connected uh, activity um, to bring these viruses. And then again, you, you face this fundamental issue of if it started with research, why does it look like it actually started at one of these markets uh, selling these animals that were implicated in the first SARS one? Uh, SARS. So, 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 Alina, you wanted to respond to this. What, what do you think? 
So I think it's really good that Linfa brought up this overlap between natural and research uh, associated origin scenarios. For me, the reason why we have to distinguish between a wildlife trade versus a research activity related origin is because the mitigation strategies are completely different. So if we want to prevent the pandemic from starting from a research activity, from field work, from thousands of uh, tens of thousands actually of samples being collected from animals, bats and markets and people in the hot spillover zone, the hot zone of SARS down in South China, then that that activity, that research activity has to be better regulated and made more transparent and accountable. Whereas if you're trying to stop a wildlife origin, like a, a trade origin, then that has to do with regulating the wildlife trade. So I, for me, the distinction is how, how do you prevent a uh, pandemic starting from these two different origin scenarios? Mm -hmm. uh, there is still a possibility, of course, of the virus having been genetically modified. And as we've seen more and more documents released from outside of China, actually, we're seeing that it's very, very possible. Scientists were collecting so many tens of thousands of samples, a database that we have no access to it now or, or since the beginning of the pandemic. We don't know what viruses they collected. We don't know what modifications were made. Um, we have, <laughs> I know that Generally, if you look globally, there are a lot of markets compared to labs. But if you look in Wuhan City, there's a yeah. lab there where people are specifically going into caves to look for these yeah. SARS viruses and bring them back to Wuhan City. So for SARS-1, within two months, scientists in China, without any help from foreign experts, had yeah. found a well-substantiated path for SARS-1 to emerge from the wildlife trade in markets into people in, in Guangzhou. And so they found like antibodies in wildlife traders uh, showing that they've been very frequently exposed to SARS viruses. Uh, whereas for SARS-2, we have none of that data. So no positive animal samples, despite searching, checking all the farms, checking all the suppliers, nothing. The, the wildlife trade in Wuhan, by the way, is much less, like orders of magnitude less, like tens of thousands of times less than the kind of wildlife trade going on in South China. Uh, they also have no uh, evidence of uh, anyone in the wildlife trade in Wuhan having been exposed to SARS virus on a regular basis prior to this pandemic. So what we see now is that there's a very strong conduit of scientists in Wuhan going down to these places where they know they will find SARS viruses, bringing them all the way up into Wuhan City, like thousands of miles. Whereas the wildlife trade, that there's no evidence. Uh, and also they've sampled thousands of bats in Hubei province where Wuhan is, no sign of any SARS-2-like virus. So the scientists, even, even Shi Cheng Li's lab herself, she published in 2019, she said that it's about a, she said that it's not about what types of bats live in different parts of China, but that the viruses are, are more delineated by geography. So China is a huge country. And so the viruses more similar to SARS-2 have all been found down in South China and now in Southeast Asia. Okay, let's, let's try to be um, brief if we can, because we have some, a lot of questions building up. But Limfa, you wanted to say something, and Jesse, you wanted to say something. Limfa, what is it you want uh, to add? I was going to follow with Michael's, you know, a uh, 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 comment about the serology on these villages that live next to the cave in Yunnan province, and three percent of them were positive with the SARS-like antibodies, but does not neutralize SARS-1. So what I think this is very important. What I try to say is, you know, for the general audience, we have this group of virus called the SARS-related coronaviruses, and start with SARS-1, and we have now have SARS-2. So the Lao paper that, uh, you know, John just mentioned that last uh, two weeks that have a preprint just came out to say there's a virus very close to SARS-2. But there's another uh, paper from Laos, you know, I mean, I don't know if uh, the panelists have read this, from the last uh, regional health journal, basically, is a serology surveillance. So they surveyed the Lao population August to September last year. So the COVID-19 outbreak was already happening, but you know Laos, you know, the community transmission was limited. So they did a general community versus the bat and wildlife traders. What they discovered is that uh, the antibody surveillance of prevalence is around 2 to 5% binds to SARS-CoV-2, but does not neutralize SARS-CoV-2. When you go to the bat handlers, it goes all the way to 20%. Still not neutralizing by binds. So what I try to say is that, uh, of course, you know, now we all, you know, get worried and excited about SARS-CoV-2. What I try to say is SARS-related coronavirus natural origins spill over to human is happening more often than we thought. 
And it's interesting, you know, Kalina, you uh, Alina, you mentioned that you know there's no evidence of uh, ever spillover in the animal trade in China. How do you know? How do you know until there's an outbreak like this? People have never done really detailed sero serology monitoring of uh, SARS-related coronavirus spillover in humans, period, right? During SARS-1, we did that. We found that the wildlife handler have a high serial preferences than the vegetable handler, but still these people don't have disease. So what I try to say is this class of virus, what we call SARS-related coronavirus or SARS-vapor virus, actually spill over more frequent than we thought. Only when there's outbreak like SARS-1 and SARS-2, then the whole world get excited and do studies. So okay. now I'm into this now, yeah. Jesse, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I guess I would just say, uh, I mean, empirically, I mean, although all of these encounters could be happening, I mean, empirically, these pandemics are rare, right? So that, mm -hmm. so that, that it, they're not happening all the time. So however many encounters there are between humans and bats, uh, most of the time they're not leading to pandemics. So, you know, I think we have to be careful of saying there are thousands and thousands of these. I mean, there may be thousands and thousands of these encounters, but clearly they're not usually productive. And I mean, I know people work with safe, uh, you know, take lots of precautions when they're working in lab, but just empirically, if you look at SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-1 clearly had its natural origin from a market. And then there was potentially uh, in 2004, uh, a few more sort of natural zoo jumps. But once SARS-CoV-1 was in labs, there've actually been uh, four different lab associated infections with SARS-CoV-1. So, I mean, the empirical fact is with these sars related coronaviruses, once they're in labs, uh, the labs appear to be a fairly efficient means to cause outbreaks, uh, you know, given that there's been at this point, even though SARS-CoV-1 is clearly in natural animals, there's been as many lab associated as natural outbreaks. Now that said, there's no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was present in any lab. There's also no evidence. I mean, if you take at face value what, what China's saying, it wasn't in any of the animals in the seafood market. Uh, it wasn't in the lab and where did it come from? You know, so I mean, clearly clearly it was somewhere and and that information is either not known or not being reported. But but I think given these uncertainties, I don't think we can weigh either of these as, as dramatically more likely than the other. I wanna switch uh, to a question from someone in the audience, Jamie McGinnis, and it's about the furin cleavage site, which has received a tremendous amount of attention. I'm gonna back up just for a moment and explain what it is. Um, this surface protein spike of the virus has a point in it that can be cut by an enzyme that um, is called the furin cleavage site. And a lot of the theories about and hypotheses about bioengineering say, how did this virus get a furin cleavage site? Because this SARS-related family of viruses, they don't have furin cleavage sites. Now, other bat coronaviruses in a more ancestral or broader family do have it. And so that's one argument against it, but it speaks to the question of bioengineering. And do any of you, Alina, you, you, you sound like you think that bioengineering is a possibility. Jesse, you don't. Um, the the DARPA proposal. I don't know if I would say that anymore. I'll, 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 but I'll, I don't know if I would say that anymore. But we... okay, okay. Well, we'll we'll get to that in a second. But uh, but the DARPA proposal that's received intense attention over the past few weeks has received intense attention attention because of a paragraph that describes an experiment where you put furin cleavage sites or other prote proteolytic cleavage sites into the viruses, so that scientists were proposing that this could be done. Lympha, you were on this proposal, though that was not your laboratory. And that laboratory that was proposing to contribute that was not the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was a laboratory in North Carolina that Ralph Barrick runs. And the proposal also was not funded. So here's my question. Do, if you, do you think that the virus could have been bioengineered? And if you don't think that, then what difference does it make what the DARPA proposal said about bioengineering other than the potential harm that could have caused? Because we're talking about the origin here. So do you think it was bioengineered? Mike and Lympha, I'm going to assume that you don't think it was bioengineered, right? Okay. Not likely. Not likely. Alina, Jesse, do you think it was bioengineered? I can take that first. I mean, I, uh, I think the and cleavage site is certainly uh, could have been compatible with with natural evolution, but 
I also no longer think that it's a conspiracy theory, uh, the idea that the current cleavage site could have been engineered. Uh, and going to the Starper proposal, I mean, I'm just going to put it out there and say that, like, the Spear and Cleavage site has been uh, extensively discussed, uh, you know, in the debate on this for, for over a year and a half. Uh, lots of people have criticized the idea as a conspiracy theory uh, for, for quite a while. I agreed with this. And I was really sort of stunned when a week ago, the Starper proposal, you know, which Peter Daszak, Ralph Barrick, Lin Fa, Zheng Li Shi are on, came out. Uh, and in that, they are specifically proposing to engineer protease, including ferrid cleavage sites in SARS-related coronaviruses. So, so as you said, the proposal wasn't funded, and that specific work, at least in that proposal, you know, from three years ago, was going to be done uh, at UNC rather than Wuhan Institute of Virology. But I think it clearly shows that the idea that someone might put a ferrid cleavage site, it's not fair to call that a conspiracy theory if, in fact, you know, the researchers involved uh, were proposing it. And I mean, I guess, and I mean, this is really a question I almost have for you, Lin Fa. I just yeah. think in the interest of what we're talking about, needing to be transparent and putting the information out there, if this sure. discussion was going on for the last year and a half and yeah. people knew that there was a proposal by some of the researchers involved, even if it wasn't funded that suggested that, why did no one come forward and just put this information out there? I mean, if, if this had been described at the beginning in a transparent way, I would say, okay, but the fact that it kind of came to light under a leak after all of this discussion, we shouldn't mention it. I mean, to me, that's just not transparent uh, and honest. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, I'm the one that, uh, because I'm a co-PI on the, on, the, on the grant, but I think I'm the one have least knowledge than you guys on the panel when you have a grant which was not funded and especially from DAPA, what's the kind of uh, you know process of uh, you know uh, uh, make this public right so that's kind of uh, not my area but what I'm in comment is again you know we are all virologists right we know this uh, uh, all the envelope virus for uh, coronavirus they need a cleavage for uh, you know I work on hand and nipple virus we all needed that protease cleavage and the protease, if it's more efficient cleave and it's more efficient for, for, for replication, right? You know, and uh, entry. So to me, this is not something that, so I'm not sort of against the idea of you can artificially insert a furing cleavage site in a coronavirus. Of course you can, right? And, but what I'm gonna try to argue is that uh, the nature always wins can do much better than us you know so i don't know if you guys have read this uh, a coronavirus called the uh, gccdc1 so what we have is a coronavirus for the audience it's a coronavirus is have one strand of rna okay so now in china and in singapore we found a backbone coronavirus has a piece that come from a real virus which is a double strand rna you know, in textbooks, you know, in RNA virology, I don't think that people will imagine that can happen, but it happened in nature. So to me, to have a recombinant virus, to have a feeling cleavage site in a, you know, back coronavirus is much easier than a back coronavirus acquire a piece of double strand RNA virus genome and recombine into it. So that's all I want to say is that- oh, uh, Olympa, yeah, you, you, Because yeah. of your connection to the grant, because of your connection yeah. to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, do you yeah. have problems with the transparency here? That's what Alina and Jesse repeatedly are referring to, that there yeah. hasn't been enough transparency. Are you troubled by the transparency? Well, I'm not because I don't understand the rules of you failed a military in that grant. What's the proper procedure of release that information? Because do we always release failed grants? Right. But did you know about that, that paragraph in the proposal? Did you know that that was part of it? Of course I know. So why didn't you publicly say, yes, there was a proposal to do this experiment. It didn't but happen. But it's not up to me, right? I, I'm not that part, you know. So what I have been saying is that uh, from day one, I said to engineer a coronavirus, right, in a lab, technically that's possible. But to engineer a SARS-CoV-2 from existing knowledge, that's not possible. Yeah. And Mike, what do you think about this issue? Um, well, for, first of all, I would say that Shi Zhang Li has been pretty clear uh, about um, th this virus not being 
handled in her lab before the, the outbreak. Uh, and, and so we do have to, it, you know, to take Jesse's point about what's a conspiracy theory, these can be kind of emotive terms. Uh, but this really does require a conspiracy uh, and a cover up uh, if Shi Zhang Li was really doing this work with a, a SARS CoV 2 like virus, um, then she, th th there's a sort of conspiracy to, to keep that secret. But what I wanted to do, actually, since John, you talked about the spike protein that is, is the one that, that is kind of the, the Velcro that sticks the virus to the cell. And then this furin cleavage site, it kind of puts the virus on a hair trigger so that once it gets into the binds to cell, it can get in and be very infective. So that's the magic sauce of this virus. That's whether it's natural or genetically modified. Um, th this is why this virus is circulating in humans and all of those other thousands of viruses that cross into people are not. And I just wanted to show since you mentioned also the these uh here actually. oh mike it's backwards can you reflect it in a mirror no, uh, okay. Okay. Got it. okay so so this actually right here uh here is the furin cleavage site of sars cov one uh, sars cov2 the very top one PRR. You're showing us the RNA sequence or the DNA sequence. No, this is this is the amino acid sequence. The amino acid, sorry. These yeah, are yeah, the yeah. building blocks of the protein, and and the amino acids PRRAR are what give this virus the ability to really be successful in humans. Uh, but below that are these viruses from Laos that just came out, uh, and what you can see there is they also have something very similar. It's not a technically a furin cleavage site, but it, it, it's, it's very similar. And uh, if genetic modification of this virus did occur, the people doing it would have had to have used a sequence of, of nucleotides to splice into the genome uh, that happened to be almost exactly the same as the ones that we see in these viruses from Laos. Um, and so th this, is, this is the kind of data that you need to actually go to and think about uh, when you're talking about this DARPA proposal. Uh, and to me, it's just not plausible that uh, this sequence uh, that you find in bats naturally, just a slight tweak on that uh, was what would have been um, inserted into this genome. It, it, it actually makes no sense. Alina, you had a question for Lingfa. Uh, yeah, but let me address okay. some of the points that have been raised first. Okay, so we're running not, out of time. Okay. So let's be brief. Okay. It's not a conspiracy for scientists to not disclose their data. It's very normal. And in fact, we have no insight to all the viruses collected at the WRV after 2016. If you read the literature, all those viruses have been collected before 2016. So we have no idea what they've found. And if you read the DAPA proposal, they said precisely they were copying parts from nature. They were looking at natural furin cleavage sites and putting these into SARS viruses in the lab with slight tweaks. So what we are seeing is completely consistent with a lab escape of a virus that had a furin cleavage site from nature put into it. So um, my question for Linfa is who proposed this furin cleavage site insertion in the paper? Was it Shi Zheng Li? The she no. proposed to put the furin clip site. So was it no, I mean, that's time? that's not, uh, I mean, I don't know who proposed. That's not uh, uh, the part. We each have a part, right? The Wuhan Institute was the field research, either bat immunology and uh, UNC is doing the virology. So that it's pretty obvious, right? Yeah. No, so, but who proposed the idea? Because the idea says that we are reviewing our deep sequencing data. We've seen these cleavage sites and we're going to put them into SARS viruses in the lab. So the question is yeah, who but, the idea and access to this data and could do it in the lab in a seamless way? UNC, right? It's a UNC lab. Is this, I mean, the, 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 the grant is very clear. It's a university in North Carolina. In case yeah, 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 yeah. But I want to uh, jump to a question from um, uh, Emily Kopp, a reporter at um, CQ Roll Call. How can the press coverage of this improve? And and Linfa, I'd also like you to address, because you have collaborated with Shou Zhang Li, and she yeah. has been, uh, in some cases, you know, put up, as Mike said, as having been involved, if this is true, with a, a major yeah. conspiracy. So yeah. how can the, do you think the press has been fair to her? 
this is what you know i mean i have to explain not only i work with you know, Cecily, but i grew up in china right you know so i left china to do a phd in california so i said you know i don't know you know the western sort of uh, philosophy and the way to deal with this is you are innocent until you're proven guilty and i think for this whole sars cov 19 origin is you're already guilty until you're proven innocent you're guilty because you're in wuhan that's it. What happens if this outbreak start in Beijing and we have the most kind of, you know, well recognized virus research lab in Wuhan? Do we still think that it's all happened because of the lab engineering? Yeah. Well, and what are other okay, things? So as a scientist, you know, I feel pretty sad because just a, a geophysical co-location, now you're guilty. And that well, showed me uh, you did not do it. To be, to be fair, the Chinese government has not been transparent again and again, which has fueled yeah. a lot of the skepticism. I, I, don't want, I don't want to comment about the Chinese government. I want to comment about, about the scientists working on the back coronaviruses, including Shi Zhengli, up until maybe February, March last year, right, 2020. I can tell you the Nature paper that Shi Zhengli published on summit on 20th of January, and I was in Wuhan with her, right? What she was worried about is the Red G13 is not close enough for the SARS-CoV-2 because people will not believe it's a bad virus. So if she had a one which is a 99.9, .9, she will put in the nature. But according to Alina thinks that, you know, they're covering up something they don't want to show. So to me is that uh, up until this politics comes out about SARS-CoV-2. I think the Chinese scientists are always joking with Shi Zhengli. I said, you can publish more freely than I can do, you know, uh, uh, outside China. So, okay, you, so to, be, to be succinct, you don't think the press coverage that's criticized her has been fair? Oh, obviously, you know, I mean, I know her very well. So I said, you know, as a scientist, I collaborate with so many different scientists in terms of moral ground, high ground, and the, the character, I think, uh, you know, all the collaborators are put there on top. What do the others think about how the press coverage could be improved? Um, so, so I think there's been some swinging back and forth, uh, uh, and and for quite a long time, the lab leak idea was not considered even a possibility uh, by a lot of people in in the press. Uh, and that was partially why Alina and Jesse and I thought it would be good to, to write this letter in science. Uh, my feeling, having um, in, in a way initiated that process by emailing uh, Jesse that maybe we should send something to science about this idea, is uh, I kind of regret that it's caused the pendulum to swing to the other side and now the lab leak idea is actually getting much more press interest and coverage. And to me, it's just out of balance with what the science is saying about the uh, likely uh, mode of emergence. Alina? So I'm going to say that this type of event where scientists can speak to each other publicly has been long awaited. It's taken too long to get here, and it's so important for public trust and also for relationships between scientists to be able to talk face to face or through Zoom or Skype or whatever. So, the issue here is that really we need to set a precedent for tracking future pandemics. And to this day, there has been no investigation of any lab origin hypothesis. We've been blocked at every turn. So, it's not about presuming guilt is about investigating a possible accident. We're not talking about deliberate release of bioweapons. We really just want to find out, is there an accident in the lab that led to this? And accidents are happening at increasing frequency. In 2019 alone, there were at least four re accidental releases of select agents in the US per week on average. So it's totally possible to have an accident. We just want to find out how it happened so we can stop it from happening again. Like We can't have a pandemic like this every five to 10 years and not know where it came from. Jesse? Yeah, I would just like to echo, first of all, thanks uh, for hosting this and thanks for everybody participating because I fully agree that having uh, these sorts of conversations and probably these sorts of conversations had been had a lot earlier, uh, things would 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 be much better. And I guess the point that I just want to end with is, I, I mean, clearly uh, none of us know exactly what happened. And I think 
we just need as uh, much transparency as possible. I hope that we're going to be able to get to the uh, truth of what happened. Uh, maybe we will, maybe we won't, but I certainly hope that the world, which is now watching this, uh, knows that all scientists uh, involved are being as transparent and open as possible. And as a scientist for like the reputation of science, I hope that we don't see more things like, you know, grant proposals that have been, you know, kept secret for years leaking out and things like that, because that's going to be bad for science. Everybody needs to step up and be as transparent and honest as possible. Well, I also want to tell the audience something they may not know, which is that the four of you have never had a discussion like this together. <laughs> and uh, I, I do hope that there are more of these with other people who are at the front of addressing these questions. And I do think the effort is going to help clarify the difference between what's possible and what's probable. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things are possible. Yeah. And the whole realm of science is about determining what's most probable and then following up there. So I want to thank uh, the four of you for taking the time out to do this and for addressing all. We, we didn't have any restrictions on any questions mm -hmm. here. Anyone was free to ask anything. And I think yeah. everyone knows that who's on the panel. And, and I thank you all for being so transparent and open about your thoughts. So thank you very much. And I hope this happens elsewhere soon with another group of panelists. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.